Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those joining us at various time zones. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW, and I'm delighted to welcome a global audi audience. Uh, we have close to 300 registered attendees for this program, and we're delighted to have a stellar panel of experts with us to help us explore this timely topic. Um, I'll start with uh, Kirsten Fontenrose, the Director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. She has 20 years of experience working with the national security apparatus of countries in the Middle East and Africa from positions within the U.S. Department of Defense, Department of State, and the White House, where she served as the Senior Director for Gulf Affairs at the National Security Council, leading the development of U.S. policy toward the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council, Yemen, Egypt, and Jordan. David DeRoche uh, is a non-resident fellow, fellow with us here at the AGSLW and uh, the Associate Professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where he specializes in the countries of the Arabian Peninsula. He joined NISA in 2011 after serving in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy in numerous positions, including as Director for the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and Ali Alfone, uh, Senior uh, Fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute. He is a political scientist by training and the originator of the theory of transformation of the Islamic Republic of Iran into a military dictatorship. And uh, I have to plug Ali's latest book, just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, Political Succession in the Islamic Republic of Iran, Demise of the Clergy and the Rise of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. I'll share a link to um, Ali's uh, book for you to browse and uh, purchase. Uh, in the chat uh, in, in a couple of seconds. And uh, moderating the session today is AGSIW senior resident uh, scholar Hussein Abish. Uh, before I pass it on to Hussein, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website tomorrow. Also a reminder to our audience, you will be in a listen only mode, but you can ask your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom, uh, or you can email us at info at agsiw.org or tag us on Twitter at Gulf States Inst. With that, Hussein, over to you. Thank you very much, and it, it's great. Again, we have another superb panel, uh, and that's one of the upsides of the COVID pandemic is we get the very best panels we can get because it's, it's easy for people to come together online. So it's great to see uh, Kristen, uh, Dave, and Ali together here to discuss this very important issue. I mean, uh, the, the sanctions that we're talking about expiring uh, in three days' time on the eight, on October 18th were imposed in July uh, 2007 by the Security Council uh, when tensions, international tensions over Iran's nuclear program reached their, their high point. Uh, but the process by which they expire in a couple of days, in three days' time, uh, was part of the July 2015 joint comprehensive plan of action, the Iran nuclear deal uh, that the United States and um, five other uh, international actors, the P5 plus one, and others, the, the permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, uh, entered into with Iran. Now, the United States withdrew uh, from that uh, a couple of years ago and then attempted to uh, extend the embargo and this was rebuffed in August. Um, and, uh, you know, really uh, the, the entire sort of project to use the um, JCPOA mechanism to achieve sanction snapback and to go to the uh, Security Council and extend the embargo, uh, both appear to have failed at least, at least technically, at least legally, right? So legally, in theory, Iran should be able to buy and sell major conventional weapons. And what are we talking about? There? Battle tanks, armored combat vehicles, large caliber artillery, combat aircrafts and drones, attack helicopters, warships, and most significantly, probably in this case, missiles and missile launchers, including man pads that um, you know, uh, missiles operated by individual personnel. Um, all of this has become uh, possible precisely because the, the U.S. effort to use the JCPOA grievance mechanism failed. John Bolton, not exactly an Iran uh, dove, called that effort too cute. And, and he's quite right. It was too cute to withdraw from the 
the entire mechanism and then to come back and try to utilize the mechanism was just a bit, a bit too much and it didn't work. And uh, nobody wanted to go along with the extensionist. I believe only the Dominican Republic voted with the United States of the Security Council. That's, that's pretty bad. However, uh, the United States is not without options. Right? There, there are uh, sanctions available to Washington, Treasury, and other aspects of the U.S. Uh, government can exercise leverage over uh, U.S. Uh, friends and foe alike and private companies all over the world and make its views clearly known with or without uh, international mechanisms through which to do that. So we're going to look at all of this today with our guests. And I think we'll begin by asking Dave to walk us through what arms uh, of the ones that I mentioned, uh, what is Iran looking for? What's its shopping list like? Right? It, as it goes out, theoretically, and you know, I mean, it, it's really interesting that uh, President Rouhani gave a televised speech the other day uh, on Iranian TV on U.S. failure, he called it. And, and he declared as of Sunday, which is October 18th, we can purchase or sell arms from anyone and to anyone we desire. But, you know, bluntly said that. And, and by the way, he, he um, touted that as an achievement of the JCPOA. He's come under incredible amount of criticism, including from the Supreme Leader for having shepherded Iran into the JCPOA. And he's saying, oh, well, look, the JCPOA got us out of the embargo. If nothing else, this is great. Awesome. So Dave, what's Iran's shopping list look like? Well, thanks, Hussein. It's an honor to be here with all these experts. So let me start off by pointing out that um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that the Iranians uh, may want, but they don't have a lot of money. Um, go forward to number four. Uh, yeah, there we go. So they, they don't have the money to uh, buy a lot of stuff. Um, skip forward to please to the slide with the single missile on it. I can get to this if you want. And uh, I'll ask the center to make these slides available if anybody wants it. So there's a couple of things that they want. They want some things that are off the shelf that they will probably buy completely. There are other things where they want components, uh, rocket motors, for example, and uh, guidance, solid fuel rocket motors, and then probably some enablers, uh, command communication, computers control, and uh, global positioning systems, uh, not, not necessarily the US GPS, but something that will be able to operate like that in a denied environment. Um, precision guidance or? Precision federal? guidance that precision guidance that, that and precision enabling that will allow them to operate on the battlefield in a controlled but distributed manner. Right now, they, uh, they and their proxies tend to operate in a distributed manner, but under very loose control. And they want to be able to do this in an environment where there's uh, electronic warfare conducted against them, which is clearly uh, the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is the wish list of what we think they want from Russia. Um, people have said this, but again, there's not a lot of money as the budget slide showed. Um, some analysts have said that they'll buy, you know, air to air fighters, that they will buy um, uh, tanks. Uh, honestly, I think that there will be some small purchases of uh, fighter aircraft. This is the Su-30 uh, and the T-90 tank. I think there will be some small purchases not so much to um, fulfill a strategic or operational need, but rather just to show we can. And even though they're in a period of, of uh, budget uh, stress, I think that uh, uh, sometimes pride uh, overwhelms a person's own best interests. And I think just to make a point that they can do it, they will. But I don't think they're going to seek to build an air force that's on a par with, say, Saudi Arabia's. Uh, first off, they can't afford it. Uh, secondly, they don't really need it. They project their air power with missiles. And then third, if they do this, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to control an army where you can move people around relatively easily, but because you put so much money into training pilots, um, air, air forces pose a unique coup risk, and I think that would be an internal security risk. Now, the systems on the bottom uh, to the left is the S-400. I think that that is something that will be bought off the shelf air defense system. Even though this wasn't technically covered by JCPOA since it's a defensive system, uh, this is clearly desired. They already have the S-300. I think they want to upgrade that to the state of the art as a means of deterring attack against them. And then to the right is the Bastion Coastal defense system, which uh, the highlight of that is the uh, Yakuns or uh, NATO SSN-25 uh, Oryx 
um, anti-ship missile, which is a powerful um, deterrent against, uh, uh, you know, naval uh, uh, things. It's, you know, it's, it's basically the Russian carrier killer, and it's one of the fastest cruise missiles in the world. So I think the two bottom systems are what they're likely to buy from Russia off the shelf. Next slide. From China, I think the uh, list is a little bit different, and this is more speculative. Um, there's a possibility that they'll buy the uh, C-802 missile, which is, again, an anti-ship missile based on uh, causes and then the uh, based on cost. And then the uh, truck mounted on the bottom is the DF-21. This is uh, marketed as the carrier killer. Um, uh, now, here I'm a little less certain that they might purchase this because... Um, Honestly, Iran has a robust missile system, uh, missile development industry, which is uh, constantly improving, which has made uh, significant increases in guidance, uh, which is fairly well engineered. And uh, we're seeing things like moving away from steel towards aluminum and now towards composite bodies of the missiles that decrease weight and increase uh, range. So they may not buy a Chinese whole system unless it possesses a clear techno technical advantage or unless they do it again for political reasons to show they can or to strengthen the alliance or, you know, as uh, replacing uh, you know, as oil for weapons. And then naval patrol craft are a possibility, again, if they offer a significant advantage, but it should be known that Iran has robust uh, weapon facilities, uh, you know, robust abilities to produce their own naval craft, uh, small naval craft. So it would have to be a significant advantage or uh, procurement for an extraneous reason, like um, basically just finding something that China makes that they want that they could swap oil for, um, improving on the earlier oil for uh, stuff that some Iranians called oil for junk. So in, in summary, what I'm saying here is that uh, Iran is a country that has a robust culture of weapons engineering and development, not the pure science, but they have a skilled labor force and skilled engineering force. They will only purchase weapons in, a, in large numbers in niche capacities and they're likely to purchase components that can be incorporated like rocket numbers or rocket motors, rather like um, uh, guidance systems that can be incorporated into homing devices, perhaps some uh, denial or defeat things like uh, optical jammers that might defeat against uh, defeat drones or anti-tank guided missiles. And then small arms that offer a clear advantage, like an upgraded version of the Cornet anti-tank guided missile. But this idea that they're going to sit out and build uh, basically an air force that can counter the Saudi air force in the air, I think is misguided. And uh, I think I'll leave the monologue there and welcome questions. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for that intro, Dave. Uh, Ali, I'm going to ask you the, the flip side. What's, uh, on Iran's, what's in Iran's for sale catalog? What are they offering to clients and customers around the world? Because they're going to want to sell, right? They need foreign exchange rather desperately. And uh, one of their, as Dave kept saying, they have a robust set of um, defense industries, and uh, limited, but uh, some of them are are, um, you know, the kind of stuff that you could sell around the world and bring in foreign exchange. What do they got? So a very good morning to you, Hussein, and, and, and the audience. Thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you for providing maybe this opportunity to share my analysis with you. Uh, and yes, it is correct. Uh, Iran experienced uh, arms embargo in the 1980s during the war with Iraq. It was a bitter experience, so the country's leadership decided to have a home uh, industry and indigenous arms industry uh, developing some of the arms that the country needed. Uh, Iran began with reverse engineering, uh, very much like many other developing countries, purchasing Soviet arms or North Korean missiles, trying to uh, replicate them, and, or, or, or even in some cases improve them. And that has happened. Today, Iran has a, a significant uh, home and indigenous arms industry. Uh, when it comes to exports, uh, looking back at Iran's arm exports for the past 20 years, we see that uh, according to the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, uh, Iran exported approximately $429 million worth of arms, which is a very, very small amount. Now, the real number may be higher, but not too much higher because of all the restraints that uh, Iran has faced over the years. 
Uh, we also should distinguish between uh, uh, militia groups aligned with Iran, which have access to specific weapon types produced in Iran, and then all other types of countries which have purchased uh, Iranian manufactured arms. Uh, Iran's allies, such as the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah and the Yemeni Houthi, they have access to some of the more sophisticated weaponry, uh, particularly uh, ballistic missile types, uh, and, and, and perhaps, uh, this is not something we, we, we can prove, uh, perhaps also cruise missile types uh, that Iran managed to reverse engineer from uh, US produced uh, cruise missiles. Uh, and, 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 and they appear to be very accurate and, and, and there were some incidents in, in the past year or so uh, with those cruise missiles. Now, uh, the truly remarkable part of uh, that kind of export, of course, uh, is that the Iranian leadership, because of the difficulties of exporting uh, the systems intact, uh, they assemble those missile types uh, in Yemen or in Lebanon. That, of course, also necessitates that Iranian engineers are there. And we increasingly see a new generation of Quds Force commanders who are, in reality, also production engineers uh, in charge of the assembly networks, assembly plants in Lebanon and in Yemen. Uh, for example, Brigadier General Shahlai in Yemen, one of his uh, achievements uh, by all accounts uh, was to establish those assembly plants. Uh, Mr. Hejazi, who is now the second in command of the Quds Force, he was the head of an assembly plant in Lebanon prior to his appointment to become uh, the second in command of the Quds Force. So in other words, uh, being a good production engineer is one, now one of the skills that Quds Force commanders need in order to be promoted within their organization. When it comes to all other countries, the largest uh, buyer of Iranian arms uh, in, in the past 10 years or so, unsurprisingly, it was, was, was Syria. Uh, Syria purchased more than $300 million worth of, of arms from Iran. Uh, those arms systems were anything from uh, light arms, mortars, uh, to ammunition. Uh, uh, and of course, also some, some uh, assembly plants that we, we have seen in, in, in Syria. Uh, but we also see another tendency where the Quds Force has tried to get engaged in conflicts in the African continent. Sudan was one of the major importers of Iranian arms prior to the change of system in Sudan. Uh, but uh, Iranian produced ammunition has been traced uh, almost all over Africa, uh, which tells me that there is a proliferation network uh, uh, pr uh, proliferating uh, and exporting Sudanese produced and Iranian produced ammunition all over the African Mostly continent. Small arms and ammunition? Yes, yes. And, 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 and I just, 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 just to conclude, the monetary, for now, the monetary value for Iran is limited. Iran appears to be using it for, for tactical reasons in order to have a say in, in, in various conflicts, in order to have influence over uh, other countries. Uh, but the monetary dimension may become more important in the future if the maximum pressure uh, campaign continues and Iran is in even more desperate need of hard currency that it cases today. A uh, quick follow-up on that is are they, these, these uh, small arms and, and ammunition, are they sold at, at cost or, or in a, a kind of uh, at, a, at a reduced rate in order to gain foothold and gain leverage? And that would cut then against the kind of foreign exchange you know, uh, agenda. Yes. Until now, in order to, to have a better marketing position, Iran apparently has sold them under the market value. Market value, right. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So, uh, Kristen, uh, let me uh, switch to you. You're, you're still muted. So, if you, if you could unmute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and let's just then examine for a second what U.S. options are in this case. USG has definitely got, uh, it, it has apparently, State Department has failed to convince uh, the Security Council to extend the embargo. That did, it, that did fail. And sanctions snap back as a formal uh, reality is maintained only by the United States. They, USG says there is sanctions snap. Everybody else says that there isn't. Uh, but uh, the U.S. has plenty of options. So if you can talk about how uh, Washington is likely to respond to this and what uh, U.S. options are 
at this stage. Uh, I'd, I'd be grateful and take as much time as you like. Thank you for your patience, by the way. Sure, no, thanks for having me. This is a fantastic discussion. I've been madly taking notes on uh, what Dave and Ali have said as well. Um, what we do know is that regardless of, uh, you know, the opinions on snapback by the international community, U.S. secondary sanctions on Iran that the U.S. put in place in 2018 when it withdrew from the JCPOA are frankly more impactful than U.N. sanctions anyway. So the effect on Iran's economy of the embargo being lifted will frankly be minimal. But the effect on the security and stability of the region you know, could be notable since Iran prefers arming the IRGC over spending funds on domestic needs, regardless of that economic pressure. And the availability to Tehran of more powerful weapons will make the region very realistically, other parts of the world, less safe. But economically, what we could also see is that the end of the embargo will mean greater economic risk for some countries and some companies outside of Iran, because small states without the capacity to interdict shipments that transit through their waters on the way to Iran will still face U.S. sanctions, regardless of the embargo ending, regardless of what the U.N. does. So if shipments of defense articles to Iran increase after the embargo ends, these transit states could be in more danger of violating U.S. sanctions and winding up economically burned. The U.S. will continue to enact new sanctions on IRGC-connected businesses as intelligence about IRGC investments and purchases continues to surface. And I think no matter who you see in the, in the presidency uh, come 2021, you're going to see a continued effort to dig into where the IRGC is active. There will be choices made about where to enact sanctions and where not, but getting to the root of how the IRGC raises money will, will still be a priority. And because the IRGC is entangled in so many sectors, these sanctions are likely to impact countries that are currently unwitting uh, when the embargo ends. So another option that the U.S. is looking at uh, is strategic litigation. And again, I think this is very viable regardless of who comes into the presidency. And by this, I mean holding individual members of the regime in Tehran accountable for their role in terrorist activity or human rights abuses that break international law. So you're litigating the crimes of individuals at the top which squeezes them personally, rather than applying sanctions across the board and potentially expanding the painful impact to the general public in Iran. And at the Atlantic Council, we're researching the legal basis for options for this. The problem we have in the U.S. government at present is that the folks in the U.S. government um, and the international community as well have limited options. On the one hand, there are kinetics. And on the other hand, there are sanctions, but there aren't a lot of tools in the middle. Something like strategic litigation would be a new tool in that quiver. In terms of diplomacy, the U.S. has and will continue to work through diplomatic channels to bring Russia and China around to an understanding. They have more to lose from selling arms to Iran than they have to gain financially. And that's because the dollar amount of, of sales that Iran will be in a financial situation to purchase will be less impactful on the economies of Russia and China, potentially, than the sanctions that would be triggered on their state-owned corporate enterprises if they make those sales. Um, America's Gulf partners have been asked to try to apply that pressure because, you know, the U.S., NATO countries, we don't have a lot of leverage with Russia. Um, and we're trying to ask them to help with making that case to Russia, that if Russia, for instance, sells arms to Iran, that would make Gulf nations much less safe. And the Gulf states have working relations with Russia that are positive, but they do not appear to have the leverage um, that we would like to see to make that happen. So I do think that what we're most realistically looking at is additional sanctions by the U.S. or simply the more stringent enactment of sanctions that exist on companies and on entities in small states that right now are not dealing with the, the, the volume of flow to Iran that we would see after the embargo. So that risk really does rise for those entities. Great. Um, can I ask you a quick follow-up? Um, when, when you talk about unwitting participants, you know, can you give an example of that? Even if it's a hypothetical example, what, what sort of um, company would find itself unwittingly participating? I mean, what sort of Goods would sure. Yeah. So as Dave mentioned, what we're expecting is that Iran's domestic industries will increase production. So it won't necessarily mean that you are part of a company that's selling a, a, file, a fully cooked missile to Iran. But if you make the screws that go into a component that Iran is building to upgrade an existing system, you're sanctioned. 
So if the embargo lifts and they're able to do more of this domestic production or they're able to buy components that would upgrade their existing things like um, image lenses for their drones that would increase their ability, you know, to the, the lens capacity of their drones, for instance, or any sort of payload or uh, some, an attachment that lets them carry more volume. Any of these things, even if they look very technical, would actually be sanctioned because they would be contributing to arms, uh, Iran's domestic arms production manufacturing. So it would be considerable risk to sell anything tangible. To, to Iran at this stage. Uh, Very high risk. I mean, to mitigate that, the US and Switzerland have put into place this new Swiss humanitarian trade piece, the SHTA, that will allow banking institutions to feel confident that what they are, the companies they are working with are providing material to Iran that is, that is uh, considered legitimate humanitarian food assistance. The you like. have to go through that process or you have to go through that risk. process. Yes, and hopefully other countries will open similar processes. It, as a company, you're laying out quite a bit of information about your company, but you do have that security that you can sell to Iran without the risk uh, of sanctions. Otherwise, because your lawyers have a heart attack. Yeah. Right, and banking institutions are less likely to work yeah. with your company. Yeah, they won't. Yeah, they won't lend you the money because right, they'll be gone. Um, let me just say before I go to Dave, who's being patient, um, I'm getting some questions through the Q and A function. They're great. Uh, keep them coming. Now is the time to start sending them in. Dave, uh, please. Well, I, I just want to pile on a point Kristen touched on. But when you look at Iranian drones, uh, really all Iran does with these is integrate them and work on the bodies, particularly the bodies of the composite. All of the, and of course the warheads, um, but all of the guidance, motors, propellers, um, and communication system for almost all of them are procured commercially uh, around the world, the engines, everything. So um, this, this sort of sanctions that Kristen's talking about will, would directly affect uh, the drone thing. Um, another example is with um, passive uh, IEDs that we saw in Iraq, which were provided by the uh, IRGC to their various minions in Iraq for use against U.S. forces. The IRGC related things produced the penetrator plates, but a lot of the um, passive signaling things were adapted from uh, garage door openers, which were purchased, we think, in the United States and Canada. So there, it's, it's almost impossible, given the nature of this, to, to determine what is a legitimate technological transfer versus a potential militarized technological transfer. And the U.S. methods here will kind of force things into a clear channel because we've seen um, things that look innocent on the outside be converted into particularly lethal weapons of war by the Iranian regime. Garage door opener is a very good example. I appreciate that. Now, yeah. It occurred to me, but uh, you know, yeah, anything can work. So, uh, Ali, I've got a question for you from uh, Safana Zaini, uh, who wants to know if the lifting of the Iran arms embargo uh, will affect Hezbollah's weapons arsenal at all, and could we see an increase in Hezbollah military activity, etc.? What do you think? I have difficulties believing that because Hezbollah would not be following uh, UN uh, Security Council resolutions under any circumstance. So I'm not expecting any greater change. Uh, uh, and I also do believe that Hezbollah is already uh, suffering somewhat from the economic uh, aid that it used to get from Iran, but not when it comes to arms. Uh, Iran is capable of uh, providing Hezbollah with, with uh, the uh, uh, short and medium range missiles that it did before. Uh, through Iraq and, and Syria, Iran has been capable of maintaining an overland uh, um, corridor to uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, and uh, the greatest threat uh, to that corridor is not so much the sanctions regime, but the Israeli uh, Air Force bombardment of those uh, uh, transfers. Do we agree that there's unlikely to be an impact on not just Hezbollah, but uh, other clients of Iran, uh, the pro-Iranian PMFs, uh, the Houthis, etc.? Or isn't, I mean, it strikes me that if Iran gets more and more into the weapons business, that would have eventually some kind of a knock-on effect, even if the flow doesn't change. Um, uh, what do you so think? The biggest impact, at least in, in, in the short and medium, medium term, uh, will, will not be so much on, on the non-state uh, uh, clients of Iran. Uh, 
uh, the like biggest Syria. impact would be like, let's say a country like Syria, or, or I would yeah. say a country like Iraq even. Uh, yeah. The Iraqi government in 2014 signed a contract to purchase almost $200 million of, of, of worth of, of our arm from, from Iran. And the US government has tried to pressure the Iraqi government with reference to the UN Security Council resolutions, you know, with the embargo. Now that the embargo is no longer there, then the uh, allies of the Islamic Republic in Iraq could argue that uh, the Iraqi uh, state uh, and Hashim al-Shaabi and others should purchase more Iranian arms. So those state actors, I think, you know, they would be more active and impacted in a much higher degree than non-state actors, such as the Houthis or, or the Lebanese as well. I think both Dave and Kristen want to want to intervene. So please, um, let's begin with Dave and, and then we'll go. Oh. Well, thanks. I, I you seem very keen. Well, it's just, it's just. Uh, uh, I'm going to say something really foolish. So normally you're not supposed to make predictions, but um, uh, the Iranian regime put a lot of money into reverse engineering and and updating uh, basically a 1960s U.S. air defense missile system called the Hawk that was sold to the Shah. And there was co-production. They call it Mursad. Um, it, I think that was money wasted. I think it was done for reasons extraneous to uh, sec rational security concerns. Uh, you know, we do the what? same thing. Oh, and one up the United States. Well, no, basically saying we have this, we have to do it because they imported co-production facilities and they just put too much money into uh, technology. I predict the Mossad will be exported uh, just to justify the domestic investment made in, in Iran. I don't think it'll have much of an impact. It is an air defense system, so you know we could see it in Syria or maybe in Lebanon. But uh, that's that's my that's my uh, I got a little bit of gambling blood here, and and uh, that's my prediction. Sorry, go, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to agree with everything they said when when Ali first made his comment. I thought, oh, I don't know, but but you know, with his follow-on comments, I completely agree. We've we've already seen that Iran smuggles plenty of embargoed items to their their affiliates around the region. But with the embargo being lifted, it makes that volume and that flow much more significant, it makes it just simply easier for them, and uh, and it makes it much harder to interdict. And we know that they don't. Again, they don't just ship completed kits. It's not missile in a box. You know, they'll, they'll, ship, they'll ship components at different intervals. They'll ship things that, that look innocuous. Um, they'll use different rat lines. So it also just makes it far harder for international law enforcement to track the, what they are providing to their proxies. And they can ship things like 3D printers to them as well, but with their upgraded plans, uh, it just gives them a lot more capacity. They can buy one thing ship a printer and a blueprint, and it can be made in country. So, you know, there, there gives them a whole lot of new options. Okay. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of really interesting questions. Um, Mimi Burke wants to know if the UAE effort to purchase the F-35 jets impacts the balance of power in the Gulf. Anybody want to address that? They're also trying to get predator drones with precision guidance and growler electronic aircraft, uh, electronic warfare aircraft, and and other things so yeah yes dave well honestly when i look when i looked at that package i think the thing that's going to have the biggest impact is the one that's been least discussed which is the electronic warfare craft the, the growler um i think we're moving into an era now where people are increasingly focused on being networked and and having you know we, we have now have the expectations of continuous communications as you know, holding this seminar. And I think anything that disrupts that, um, as the human operators become more and more dependent on absolute precise information, anything that disrupts that's going to have a significance. Um, the Joint Strike Fighter, it's great. It's state of the art, but, um, you know, air to air, the UAE already has air superiority over the Iranians. So uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I spoke earlier of the role of pride. Um, I think there's a little bit more of that than actual cost benefit analysis and predator drones, I think, kind of falls into that as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I'm no expert like you, but it struck me that the Growler is the game changer. Here. I, mean, yeah. I, I think it does. Yeah. I think it adds a capability they don't have that, that really does sort of impact. Uh, anybody else want to venture on that or should we go on to the next question? I'd add that, you know, the Growler is, is um, definitely the game changer. And the thing that the F-35 does is increase their interoperability with the U.S. Right. and with Israel, potentially. So, the, the you know, so it acts. Yeah, it acts as a deterrent in that sense. I mean, they, as Dave mentioned, they already have superiority. The one large platform Iran might choose to purchase is new aircraft because theirs just can't be upgraded any longer. But uh, you know, looking at the Su-30, for instance, but the F-35 would send a signal that we can now operate at a much higher level with both American and potentially new Israeli partners. 
Yeah, and the Iron Dome one day may show up in the UAE. Mm, right? They're hoping. I know, I know. I know, no, I know, Dave, I know, I'm just saying. Um, all right, so uh, we have a question from uh, Zhao Yinghuang, who wants to know if uh, Iran is able to produce drones under current strict sanctions, will the production be impacted in the future if the arms emb embargo is lifted? I mean, you know, why, why do you think it'll make a difference? If, since Iran already has a, you know, a, a significant drone industry. Um, or do you think that? I don't know. Go ahead. Well, yes. um, what we've seen so far is that what they're doing is buying components from around the world, assembling them, and as I said, building the warheads, the um, the bodies in some instances, composite bodies. Um, so, uh, uh, if sanctions become more effective, uh, that will impact it. Now. You know, ISIS had a guy in Denmark who was buying drone parts and shipping them to Turkey where they were smuggled across the border. So this is a very hard thing because these are small, um, relatively, you know, propellers, you know, wooden propellers. How are you going to stop that? Uh, motors and servos, you know, from Ireland. Um, but uh, uh, it, it will have it, it will be easier in the absence of sanctions. Is, is what you can show. You can show the contrapositive. Um, but, you know, given the level of particularly labor expertise as well as engineering expertise in Iran, it is not beyond uh, their ability, you know, to focus and, and develop an entirely domestic industry. They don't have to right now. It's just because it's cheaper and easier to buy from abroad. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Kristen, you were going to add something? I would agree with that. I'd say what we're worried about is not so much the drones themselves, but the pieces on them. So things like higher quality engines for the UASs and um, optical lenses to improve their ability to produce imagery, which yeah. is the accuracy they're targeting, for instance. Yeah. Okay. So question for all of you uh, from Rehan Enya is with the exception of uh, expiration of the embargo, um, do you expect Iran to make progress in achieving a nuclear weapon? Is that part, I mean, how does this, you know, conventional agenda um, interact with a potential nuclear agenda, et cetera, and uh, what can be done to stop it? It's a very uh, wide-ranging question, but it's a good, it's a good question. What's the, what's the uh, interface between uh, the conventional arms? If, 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 if I may, 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 may try, uh, the uh, failure of the JCPOA was a huge shock for the political leadership in, in Iran. Uh, they had agreed to put the nuclear program on halt, uh, uh, then came the JCPOA and, and then the U.S. walkout, and uh, the, the future is, is very insecure. Uh, even if the administration changes, I'm not entirely convinced that a President Biden would go back to JCPOA as it was before. It is very, very likely that there will be some changes made to the JCPOA. And if those changes are uh, not acceptable to the Islamic Republic, uh, they may uh, pursue a very different path. Uh, in particular, if the uh, Trump administration uh, uh, continues uh, and there is no prospect for returning to any kind of JCPOA, uh, uh, or if President Trump himself may be interested, but the uh, individuals in the administration are not interested in achieving an, a meaningful agreement with the Islamic Republic, uh, there may be uh, significant uh, changes. Uh, but those changes uh, it would be so formidable that it, is, it has not so much to do with the uh, arms embargo. That, uh, that is a national decision that the Islamic Republic has to, has to take uh, if it really wants to pursue the path of North Korea. Uh, or not, and, and 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 from their perspective, and this is something that we hear in the in the debate uh, among the uh, some of the elites of the Islamic Republic, uh, they always say that uh, uh, Libya's uh, Muammar Gaddafi delivered all his uh, nuclear uh, uh, facilities, uh, gave up on the program. And, and suffered the destiny that he did. Uh, North Korea, on the other hand, is often depicted as a success story, uh, even though the rest of the world perceives North Korea as, as a failure. The view of, I mean, from the point of view of regime uh, preservation, <laughs> maybe it is a, a success story in all other senses, not. Uh, Dave and Kirsten, would you care to? Yeah. yeah, I would say that, you know, at the expense of sounding flip, I really think what's realistically going to happen is that you're going to have hardliners in Tehran who slow roll a nuclear deal. And so you either have no deal with the Trump administration that continues to seek one, or you have them at the table but agreeing to very little with the Biden administration. 
and you have a new hardline president in June of next year in Tehran. And therefore, what you see is Israel looking and saying, we've got to do something about this nuclear program if they continue to escalate it. If it's frozen in place, different story. But if Iran continues to ramp up its withdrawal from the JCPOA or ramp up its, its production, then I think you'll see Israel undertaking strikes again against their facilities. And at this point, um, would we see the UAE potentially involved in the planning, not execution of those strikes perhaps? Um, what a Biden administration would risk is being not read in on those. If Israel believes that a administration is being um, too soft on Iran, allowing them to continue to ramp up withdrawal, for instance, you know, or if, if their intelligence tells them that Iran is up to additional production while they are also at the table for talks, we could potentially see unilateral action by Israel that the U.S. may or may not be read in on. Great point. Uh, Dave? Well, um, let me let me take a step back. I, I, I'm in agreement with everybody. Um, uh, a lot of people, particularly in our field, think that, you know, talk about the failure of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. But that's really a regional failure. When you look at a global failure for the United States, I think the two big ones are the invasion of Kosovo and then the invasion of Libya. And uh, in the aftermath of the invasion of Libya, Toria Newland, who I've never known to be at a loss for words, she was the State Department spokesman at the time. And she was asked exactly the same question that Ali raised, which is, you know, well, here, you know, Qaddafi gives up his nuclear program and, uh, you know, he's on his way to dying in a ditch with a bayonet up his and yet you know the north koreans who have it you know are able to do this and, and that's the only time in my life i've ever seen toria at a loss for words mm -hmm. uh, she we, we don't have an answer to that and uh you know the iranians are not stupid they watch what's going on so in spite of what the supreme leader says or hasn't said and whether he's dissimilating or not um uh there's a strategic uh, uh locus there that i think is hard to hard to deny the second thing is we've kind of been treating nuclear weapons as if they are mm -hmm. um you know, they require a Manhattan project to do, but the technology gets easier and easier and easier to replicate. And I think this is kind of like um, trying to stop the proliferation of automatic weapons in the 1950s. You know, sooner or later, it's going to happen. Um, we might as well go back to the Kennedy era analysis that looked at a world with 60 nuclear powers and, and think how we're going to do it. Because I, I think the technology is becoming easier and easier. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't think there's any doubt about that. I, I've got a... Um... A, a real change of pace question from Irene Martinez, who wants to know, how would a Yuan-dominated gas trade with China, you know, between China and Iran, which is emerging, there's also a Yuan-based bank opened in Turkey, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, after the current uh, trade situation with Iran, how, how would it alter the trade situation of Iran? And do you see China, how do you see China's role in all of this? Um, it, if nothing else, and I would just say, you know, I mean, obviously not in, 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 in as a central player with regard to Iran's um, uh, weapons agenda, but with regard to its financial health and, and its uh, trade profile. Uh, China has benefited from Iran's isolation and uh, some of the people who are uh, critical of the U.S. maximum pressure campaign uh, always point out that uh, the United States in, in, our, in, in reality has chased Iran into the arms of, of, of China. Uh, the, uh, now, uh, I have my doubts concerning the 25-year uh, long cooperation agreement between China and Iran and its realization in the short term. Uh, I think that China is much more patient than that. China is not willing, uh, even during uh, a, uh, an almost trade war against the U.S., I think that China uh, knows the U.S. red lines, does not want to systematically challenge the U.S. when it comes to Iran. But of course, it all depends on development of future development of China-U.S. relations. Uh, uh, but I have no doubt that both China and Russia will betray Iran uh, if the U.S. gives them a better deal. That has historically been the case. Uh, and both China and Russia always voted against the Islamic Republic in the UN Security Council uh, whenever they were offered something better by the United States. So in that, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, I also want to warn the leadership of the Islamic Republic of relying too much and hoping too much on uh, the benevolence of, of Beijing and, and, and Moscow. Yeah, sometimes it's it's a uh, a political gesture to to cite China don't, for domestic purposes. I mean, 
Even Hezbollah was trying to uh, say, well, we'll just get investment from China in the Lebanese context, as if any Chinese investor <laughs> is going to send, uh, you know, one yuan into Lebanon without an IMF framework. It's silly. Uh, both Dave and Kristen, I think, have, have thoughts on this, I hope. No? No. Okay. Happy to comment on China oh, if you like. Please. Dave, yeah. do you want to go ahead? He, he doesn't, apparently. Oh, okay. Which is fine. Oh, I would, you know, to Ali's point, China's been, um, been buying energy sector products from Iran for pennies on the dollar, just really kind of abusing the situation, to be honest, and just floating them in offshore tankers, waiting for the day that it's needed. And um, Iran's going to run out of money that it can use to buy these things from China. So China's going to be looking for other trade-offs if they want to continue that trade. And what might they be looking for? Obviously, other natural resources. Um, China also really loves to put military folks in commercial looking roles inside of countries to exploit their natural resources. So in November of 2019, you saw them take part in the Chabahar Seaport project that was ostensibly commercial. And, um, you know, this is their standard operating procedure is to send in civilians to sort of gather intelligence in case Beijing ever needs to export that particular project for military reasons as they've done in places all over the world, we could see the regime in Tehran kind of creatively ignore their own constitution that forbids foreign militaries from basing there in order to purchase whatever it needs from China or in order to, you know, trade with China for what China wants in exchange for energy products like security for energy. The thing is that China has been very, very clear about the fact that they have no interest in securing the Gulf. So they'll be happy to buy very, very cheap energy. They'll be happy to sell uh, relatively cheap arms, but they're not going to send tankers into the Persian Gulf and they're not going to send troops to protect Iran. They, if they send uh, military personnel dressed as civilians to com ostensibly commercial projects that we all know are actually military fronts, it will be to protect China's interests and investments in whatever natural resource it is they're involved in extracting. It will not be to protect Iran or Iranians. They, no one should be unclear about that. And China's never been unclear about that. But what they will do is sell arms to both sides as well. So if they're trading arms for, for gas or something like that, you can expect them to also be selling the counter product to those arms to Arab Gulf states, you know, who are adversarial to Iran. So they'll drive an expensive arms race in the Gulf, but it won't actually make Iran safer. And Iran would then wind up giving away its gas only to be out armed by its neighbors who are also purchasing from the same place. A uh, follow-up question for Ali. Uh, we've seen Iranian leaders get into some domestic political trouble over uh, trying to kind of surreptitiously invite Russian forces into, uh, into Iran, and that didn't go over very well. Um, there are these long-standing ideas about Russian and also British designs on, on Persia and Iran that are very old, the 19th century, you know, myths slash realities, whatever. It's deep, deeply in, in, ingrained in Iranian culture that there are these two predatory powers out there that are, you know, trying to go, yeah, come, come Chinese, uh, is it easier to sell? Um, you know, even as, as, as stipulating that everything Kirsten said is correct. Um, is that is that an easier sell, uh, or it just doesn't matter? Uh, well, uh, traditionally, uh, Iran-Russia relationship was uh, a love-hate relationship devoid of, of, of love, uh, and I suspect that Iran-China relationship is developing very much the same way. Uh, the Iranian public largely uh, believes that uh, China is dumping its junk products on Iran, uh, is trying to make Iran completely indebted, uh, hoping that it can acquire uh, Iran's natural resources. Uh, the, so China has become extremely unpopular, you know, among the Iranian population. Uh, but it's mostly because of the distrust between the state and nation uh, within Iran. Uh, distrust between the uh, people who no longer believe that the uh, political elites of the Islamic Republic uh, have the interest of the Iranian population on their mind. Uh, hardly a week passes without a major uh, economic scandal being reported on in the Iranian press. So in a situation where the Iranian elites are depicted as thieves and embezzlers, who are willing to, to surrender the country to China, uh, that of course also makes China a culprit and the United States a desirable partner. So the real new game in Iranian politics, also up to the next presidential election, in, in my opinion, will be who is capable 
of talking with the U.S. in order to achieve sanctions relief. Uh, let's not forget that the main reason why President Rouhani was elected and re-elected was because of the fact that he gave the Iranian public the prospect for uh, sanctions relief from the United States and improvement of the economy. The same thing will happen up to the next presidential election. The next presidential hopefuls will not be talking about Iran-China relationship. They also will be talking about how to achieve sanctions relief from the United States, but at the same time, not to uh, surrender uh, things of uh, great importance to the regime, such as the ballistic missile program. Quick follow-up on that. Um, we're getting a bit far afield, but it's an obvious question, especially given the topic of your book. Does this uh, whole process strengthen the hand of uh, military or retired military or paramilitary uh, political figures against uh, clerical ones? In other words, will the next uh, leader be a man in green uh, versus a man in black? Uh, a presidential leader, understanding the big man in black is, is still in control. Yeah, I mean, that's stipulated, but I mean, the, 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 man, the man on the horseback, you know, as mm -hmm. usually was referred to as, you know, the coup leaders in, in, in European or South American coups is definitely on the rise. And, 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 and the importance of the arms industry in the Islamic Republic uh, will, of course, add to the powers that they have even domestically. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. That's, that's a perfect. Uh, sorry. Did either of you want to chime in on that? I just, I just, I hope Ali is correct. I unfortunately am expecting the hardliners to prohibit anyone who's interested in speaking with the U.S. about sanctions relief or anything else from running. I expect them to run only a slate of equal hardliners who will then make it their job not to arrive at an, at an U.S. I mean, that, that's my expectation um, based on things like watching them threaten Rouhani with charges of treason for even entering into the JCPOA, and just what we know about how they always try to fix um, election slates. And I think that what we're seeing in terms of some of the, the military folks who've been put forward as potential presidential candidates, what we know about them is they're completely aligned yeah. with hardliners, and they're very much under the thumb of the current Supreme Leader. So they, they're just sort of an, a new outfit, but they're not new thinking. Right. Gotcha. Uh, if I'm I may have a 10 second response. No one is against the principle of talking and negotiating with the U.S. The fight is about who should represent Iran in those negotiations. Mm. So the Revolutionary Guard would not like to see Mr. Rouhani or other technocratic types you know, engaging in negotiations because it's leverage. It's a source of power even, even within the, the political system. Domestically. Iran. Domestic leverage, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I actually, I, 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 my Expectation. I mean, I'm no expert in this, but I'm getting the sense that uh, almost any faction in Iran right now would take compliance for compliance, which is not on offer uh, as a way of going forward. But uh, but uh, yeah, but I take your point. Um, let's let's shift again, if it's all right. I've got a question from uh, Evior Marianne Lanatza from Sweden, which is great. Uh, welcome, Scandinavia. Uh, about how the U.S. is UA, the EU is going to react if Iran r resumes the, you know, major uh, weapons sales, and and especially if it if it seems to be part of a resumption of its nuclear program, uh, what sort of reaction do you expect from the EU? And and let me um, also ask about the E3, right, the, the, the European partners to the P5 plus one. Um, what sort of reaction do we expect from them? Uh, to Iran's um, policies. Uh, maybe I can begin with Kristen on this one. I think the, the, the EU is in a tough place. Frankly, I can't believe that they have not um, acted in favor of extending the arms embargo because certainly Iran has planned many things like the Paris bombing, um, you know, in their own backyards. And uh, I think the question we should be asking is why, instead of asking the U.S., why are you alone trying to extend the arms embargo? We should be asking Europe, why, why aren't you? Uh, but what I expect from the EU is that, you know, they think they have quite a bit to gain from making sales to Iran if the embargo is lifted, France's defense industry, for, for instance, and then other of their smaller component industries. But they, they actually are going to have quite a bit to lose if they wind up with additional sanctions on those companies. Um, they're, they're, I, I'm hoping that they will play another role again in mediating 
you know, in some of the diplomatic mediation, that's what we would expect from them. But they, they don't have as much leverage as we would like to pretend that they do with Iran, unfortunately, and it makes it difficult for them to have an impact. Frankly, the Macron plan was a good plan. The only flaw was that it required either the US or Iran to take the first step and neither was willing to. But the thought behind it was very good. And so if we could see the EU play a role in um, coming up with ways that would save face for both sides, whether that means encouraging a Gulf state to make the first move, for instance, that would be very helpful because um, by themselves, they have quite a bit to lose from secondary sanctions. Yeah, those of us who watch Lebanon closely, also th many of us think we see an indirect dialogue between Paris and Tehran through France's interventions in, in Lebanon and the, the engineering of a, the return of Hariri and a more comfortable position for Hezbollah quasi behind the scenes, which is where they want to be. And it looks, again, like positioning for a longer term bridging possibility. Uh, anyway, Dave, go ahead. Well, I, I just want to make a sort of, it's more of a EU point than a Middle East point, which is that um, we, we keep forgetting that the JCPOA was the first time the EU as an entity sat at the table as the equivalent there. And so when you look at the EU theology, and I'm sorry, but it is a theology, it is a secular religion, um, anything that diminishes the JCPOA diminishes the project of ever closer union. And I think this reflects a lot of the uh, sort of pusillanimous half-hearted um, uh, of of the half-hearted um, uh, response from the EU I think it's conflicted because they put the interests of ever closer unity uh, you know and, and a bigger EU on the world stage they, they view that more important than anything that happens or doesn't happen in Iran and unfortunately getting on your point Hussein um, now that Britain has left France is the only global superpower in the EU the only country in the EU with a global reach is France so the EU becomes an extension of French prestige and pride. And, and I think we, we'll see an example of irrationality. And then finally, the day after the sanctions were announced, I, a pretty senior EU person uh, in Washington, he, he looked shell-shocked. And he, he basically said, well, we've just discovered that our banks are not regulated in Brussels, they're regulated in Washington. Um, uh, so once again, we're starting to see pride and stuff. And, and that will be the case until the Germans and the Dutch and the Swedes agree to underwrite the currency and thus the economic system of Italy, Greece, and Portugal. <laughs> um, so, so um, you know, that, that inter-European thing takes precedent over the actual merits of the issue vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And I think they'll continue to take decisions that are not in their own best interest in the Iranian context because of this secular religion of ever closer, ever greater European Union. France would still be the only nuclear power in the EU. Well, not still. just nuclear, Security Council veto. Oh. Yeah, 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 many things, which, which was, global. by the way, wrongly awarded. That seat should have gone to Canada at the end of World War II. <laughs> we talked about that. That's Dave from, originally from Canada. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, it, it's true, but that's why. Uh, Ali, what about European-Iranian relations in this context? Can you speculate a little bit? Uh, the Europeans uh, suffer from the sanctions regime, not only the arms embargo, but sanctions in general. So, so they have tried to mediate between the United States and the Islamic Republic. Uh, uh, that is one of their issues. The other issue is uh, insecurity in the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. Uh, does not pay too much attention to the refugee uh, matter, but, but the question of, of, of refugees and, and migration from the Middle East, North Africa to, to, to European Union is, is a very serious issue. It is politically destabilizing. It is empowering the, the radical right, right? You know, in, in, in countries like, like Germany and, and even in France. Uh, so they believe that uh, if the Islamic Republic is uh, facing in, in, in a decade or two decades from now a collapse under the weight of its own inefficiency, uh, um, but, but also external pressure and economic sanctions, uh, they are expecting a catastrophe. They are expecting a new wave of refugees uh, and they are also aware of the some of the harmful things that the Islamic Republic can do 
uh, to, to, to provoke you know, those refugee waves against Europe. Uh, by the way, Europe has the same problem with Mr. Erdogan in, in, in Turkey, who systematically threatens that if uh, you know, the European Union does not do this or that, uh, there will be a flow of, of, of migrants to, to the European continent. Iranian leaders have learned the lesson from Mr. Erdogan and are not talking about uh, Iran's inability to control the flow of uh, narcotics to the European uh, continent if the Iranian state is not strong enough. So, so, so Europe wants to see a st stabilized Iran uh, which survives uh, and behaves reasonably well. But sometimes the wish for survival means that they overlook some of the more destabilizing activities that the Islamic Republic engages in. Yeah, the GNA in Tripoli in Libya plays the same game, especially with Italy, uh, but with Europe in general about migrants. And, and that's mm -hmm. a big selling point. You know, don't, don't look over here. <laughs> you know, look at the migrants who are holding back. It, it works with some European countries and not with others. Um, I've got a follow up from uh, Patrick Winter, who, who raises a good point. Uh, I think though he overstates it, maybe. He's, he says, does the EU not still have existing separate arms embargo of their own on Iran? My understanding, and I, I would uh, defer to the panel, my understanding is there are restrictions, but, but not in a you know, full-blown embargo that's gonna survive the 18th. But uh, it's an interesting point. Does anybody want to address that? I mean, I'm not aware of a full-blown EU embargo separate from the, no. the July, no, no one's aware of that. Okay. The, their I biggest concern would be secondary sanctions, you know, US sanctions and, yeah. and terrorist different designations. Though. No, no, that's different than the, he, the, what Patrick is saying. The EU itself, uh, no, I, I, I don't I, believe I, it I, does. I think that, that, that yeah. what they've been following uh, are, are the, the uh, Security Council sanctions that, in their opinion, expire on, on, uh, in three days' time. Is, well, there, there were also there were also sanctions on like shipments to the Syrian regime that were European well, Union sanctions that Iran probably regards as sanctions on them, but technically were sanctions. But honestly, I I, I don't know. They're not. Uh, I, I, it's a question of fact. I just don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then another question, shifting entirely to uh, back to the Gulf. Uh, Jassim Hussein in Bahrain asks if there's any possible effects uh, of all of this on the. Uh, a uh, peace deal, or uh, the norm, I should say the normalization process uh, between Israel and Bahrain uh, and uh, the relationship of that development, specifically Bahrain, not the UAE, which is the one we've been talking about, um, on Iran's weapon procurements and weapons agenda and all of that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's any direct relationship, but if any of you have any thoughts, um, it's a question we've been asked. I would I would be a little bit concerned if I was if I were Bahrain because we have seen quite a bit of transfer of weapons and capabilities to actors mm -hmm. in Bahrain from Iran. Um, in fact, we'll be issuing a paper soon out of the Atlantic Council that talks specifically about this. That walks through a lot of what um, a, a lot of the weapons technical and you know exploitation of the material found inside Bahrain. And the point of the paper is about how you source what material you find in your country. But in this particular case, all the material happened to come from, from Iran. Mm -hmm. So I think we will see additional flow. Places. Unfortunately, Bahrain is a fairly soft target. It's easy to get to. It doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't have very sophisticated mechanisms for, for mitigating Iranian transfers because they're just so darn good at it these days. Uh, and the U.S. has been paying more attention to places that have been transferring through to Iraq and to Syria, for instance. We've worked quite closely with Oman. There hasn't been the same focus on Bahrain. That may shift, and certainly Bahrain has been an excellent partner with FBI and the like in, in exploiting what we do find there, but it's not qu quite at the same point um, in terms of looking at what might be transferring. So that's a great question because it may be time when the embargo lifts to really hunker down with Bahrain and say, all right, we're expecting to see this volume increase. What can we do now together? Okay. By the way, I, I believe we stand corrected here. Uh, both Barakat Elaithi 
And uh, Herit Mintz uh, have separately messaged us to say the EU has its own separate arms embargo on Iran until 2023, which none of, all of us obsessed with American sanctions, secondary tertiary sanctions, UN arms embargo, Security Council, we're not aware of. And it's anyway unlikely that EU countries would be shipping fully developed, you know, missiles and such to, to Iran. But it is very good to know. I think we all appreciate the correction. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, Dave, did I interrupt your response or shall we go on to the next uh, well, well, it's just um, militarily, I mean, we've seen small arms, we've seen uh, IEDs and IED penetrators, we've seen a lot of weapons. Um, it would be very easy if Iran starts importing weapons, they could like launder small arms ammunition, say by procuring Chinese ammunition and, and you know, doing it that way. I think that the greater effect of normalization on the Iran Bahrain dynamic would be political. For example, um, uh, Iran could again, um, you know, assert, you know, that the three seats in the assembly for Bahrain, uh, call it a, 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 a government in exile and uh, welcome the Bahraini uh, Islamic government into the axis of resistance. I think that's a, a more likely low cost uh, uh, thing that would be consonant with the regime's rhetoric about, you know, the fight to liberate Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. So we've got a question from uh, our president at AGSIW, Ambassador Douglas Silliman, who wants to know if there are any countries or companies that have a commercial, not strategic, but a commercial interest in Iran arm production, export, or co-production in, in Iran, you know, strictly commercial. I think this is where the European countries come into play because, yeah. as you mentioned, it won't be the export of fully commissioned you know, units of arms. But their defense sectors are looking at Iran as a potential market for a lot of their smaller components. And they do have a purely commercial interest. Um, but again, they would be in danger of, of bumping up against, perhaps unwittingly or perhaps wittingly, some of the U.S. sanctions that will stay in place, that were put in place in 2018. Um, regardless of whether or not whether or not the embargo with the UN is lifted, yeah, uh, predominantly France is where I'm thinking, but also other other European countries. Right, uh, now, anybody, Russia and China's interests are purely commercial. They're not interested uh, Chinese, in Chinese. Yeah, uh, Chinese interests are are I think almost by definition uh, mercantile and commercial. <laughs> That's what yeah. Yeah. Uh, And and as you said, not strategic in the sense that the only military interest of China in this region at this point is uh, protection of investments and other related <laughs> interests, which are all come back to investments, right? Yeah. Um, anybody else want to comment on that? Shipbuilding. Shipbuilding is always an interest, but, you know, the Iranians don't have the money really to buy whole ships, but all the wow. Europe, well, basically all the developed countries have a, a surplus of military shipbuilding capacity. And of course, that's, you know, unionized labor and it's viewed as a strategic access and if the asset and if they don't have the order book, then the labor force erodes. So uh, there is a strong impetus there to do it. But I think that that wholly, you know, look at what we saw with France with the Mistral ship that was to go to Russia and wound up going to Egypt. Um, I, I I think that's just a bridge too far, to use another European metaphor, um, for uh, uh, Iran at this time. But there certainly will be an organizational impetus to try to keep ship, military shipbuilding. Okay. Uh, they, they build great ones out of styrofoam. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, great. Excellent. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Natasha Turak, who's with uh, CNBC in Dubai, old friend. Um, yeah. asks, what realistic threat all of this potentially could pose to GCC states, especially uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain? And what are those states doing to prepare for that threat? And how does the new Israeli uh, rapprochement with UAE and Bahrain play into that, if at all? But I'm more interested in the first part. I mean, how does it impact their, their own strategic calculations, threat perception, uh, and preparations? So anybody? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that you know we have seen we have seen increased uh, uh, expenditures in the among the GCC countries. Uh, we see increased arms imports from the United States, but not exclusively from the United States. We also see them. 
purchasing from Russia, which tells me that you know, they do not necessarily purchase Russian arms for the sake of the efficacy of those arms system, uh, but because they would like to maintain good relations with Russia and have Russia also paying uh, attention to, to the needs of the GCC member states uh, and not tilt completely towards, towards, uh, towards Iran. Uh, so, so, so that is a game that we, we have seen. And, and, and of course, you know, there, is, there is no parity between the kind of uh, uh, arms imports that the GCC member states are making and, and, and the kind of arms imports that the Islamic Republic is capable of because of the economic situation it finds itself in. Uh, but but uh, because the Islamic Republic has a greater willingness to use force and engage in armed conflicts, uh, the little arms that, get, uh, that Iran gets access to have a greater impact than the type of weapon systems that GCC member states are purchasing. Uh, yeah. did, did you, did you follow up? Well, yeah, I, I mean, actually, if we, could, we, we could show a slide that, that kind of does it. But, but I spoke earlier about how they probably will buy small numbers of like advanced fighters or tanks just to show they can just have that capability. Uh, that's a political statement for the most part with some military capability. The problem is from the Gulf states, they have to assume, you know, once you train, say, a squadron of fighters, um, and you have maintainers and the logistics system and all that, it's very easy to add an incremental squad of fighters. You know, to, to go from zero to 10 is very hard. To go from 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 is not hard at all. Much easier, yeah. It, it, or it's much easier, yeah. So, um, you know, intelligence, you look at the capabilities, then you look at the, um, uh, the intent, you assume the worst intent. So, uh, you know, even a small, really what I would characterize as a token purchase will have a greater impact on threat perception on the other side of the Gulf. The second thing is uh, reverse engineering. And, and uh, um, you know, I guess people, you know, the, if the center wants to put out the slide deck, but I have a slide where I look at a sort of hierarchy of defense industries. And uh, Iran is very good, you know, like their cruise missiles that they fire, uh, you know, most of their ballistic missiles, if we can go to the one that shows the, um, the three line charts, yeah, well, this is good, too. Uh, but the one before that. Thank you. So the United States is at the top where we have the science, the engineering, the labor base. Um, Iran is in the middle uh, where they have a very good engineering capability and a very trained labor force. And the Maquiadora basically assembling is most of the Arab Gulf states. What Iran has um, shown is that, you know, even if they buy a small number of weapons within 20 years, they will produce a variant of that, which in some instances is, uh, you know, even better than what they bought. And if we look at the next slide uh, with the missiles, um, if you look at the warheads of these, the, the top are Iranian missiles, the bottom are North Korean missiles. The Korean process, all of the warheads on these missiles are different. It's like they're built by different uh, teams of engineers and scientists. But if you look at the Iranian warheads, they're pretty much common. There's a great degree of commonality. So as they make incremental improvements, as they reverse engineer new technologies, integrate new imported motors, they get a much more quickly operational, lethal, and reproduced capability. And I think that's something that really, really, really concerns uh, the Gulf Arab states is that there's this uh, it's not a scientific edge, it's an engineering edge, and it's the labor that, you know, things like precision welding that doesn't really exist on the Arab side of the Gulf, except in expats. And, and practically speaking, for the most part, we're talking about purchasing North Korean missiles and, and then upgrading them, modifying them, uh, perfecting them, etc. Is that right? Well, that was 20, 30 years ago. I mean, now I don't think they're really in the market for that anymore. They're, they're competitors, as Ali's noted. They, they yeah. will probably be, be doing that. But, but you look at other forms of technology. So, you know, possibly um, uh, artillery. Um, you know, if, the, the metaphor for this is when you look at South Africa uh, under in the 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, they realized that they were at an artillery deficit when they tried to invade Angola in 76. Mm -hmm. So they basically, they didn't have a lot of pure science, but they had a lot of engineering and they had skilled labor. They built the G5 155 millimeter howitzer, which uh, to, is still, you know, one of the top five uh, right. towed howitzers in the world. Uh, Kristen, did you want to add something? You look like you did. Say that, you know, when you, when you, with our assumption that Iran will upgrade 
program and its UAV program more than purchasing large platforms or, you know, you're not coming across from Bandar Abbas in a tank, for instance. The GCC really is the front line and the extended reach of these programs, you know, the extended reach of these individual missiles will mean that they can, they are a much greater threat to, to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that that did drive some of the normalization discussion. I think um, the UAE is smartly trying to hedge against a U.S. that will be very reticent to be tough on Iran and says, look around the region, who has the best intelligence on Iran? Israel does. Yeah. Um, who is most likely to be hard line against them if they start to produce things that wind up being regionally dangerous? Israel is. So I think that was part of the calculus in arriving at now being the time to create a relationship where they're sharing more information, sharing more intelligence, and potentially, I won't go so far as to say planning together, but certainly UAE would like to know a bit more about what Israel might be thinking and what the red lines are, because it will make them feel safer. Yeah, I, I think there's zero question about that. I think that's, that's, that's a fact. That's not even speculation. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. I've got a question from Luke uh, forgive me, Preveshevsky, I think it is, uh, anyway, uh, wants to know, uh, in Poland, who wants to know about non-EU European countries, especially post-Soviet countries that may be <clears throat> in this kind of marketplace. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, small arms. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a couple things. So first off, if, if Iran chooses to develop a helicopter thing, and I think they'll have to, they'll probably go with some variant of the MI-17 platform in an attack variant. And those come from post-Soviet countries that make various components. And then when we look at small arms, I'm talking specifically about uh, things like uh, anti-tank guided missiles and uh, um, uh, shoulder launched uh, anti-tank missiles that have advanced warheads that can defeat slat armor or reactive armor. Uh, so these are sort of um, uh, refinements of Soviet weapon systems that, you know, uh, we've seen out of other countries that, that, that will be useful as a, and will be exported to various militias because they can negate that uh, advantage of armored vehicles that we see in the United States as partners. Uh -huh. If I may add, uh, the um, Iran importing know-how and weapon systems from uh, Central Asia, you know, post-Soviet mm -hmm. Central Asia, is more of a 1990s phenomenon. You know, the stories yeah. about Kazakhstan, you know, yeah. he, he does say and, he doesn't uh, Georgia, think like Armenia, and, and I think that nowadays, you know, the weapon systems have become so much modernized that Iran is looking elsewhere for, for, for its imports. He, he, he did, our, our question from Poland did say he didn't think it was like but yeah, you... I got a, I got an alibi, electronic warfare, electronic encounter, electron. That's the big thing. And, and we've seen that a lot of the post-Soviet states producing things like uh, very efficient GPS jamming mm -hmm. uh, systems, you know, indiscriminate, but efficient. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's definitely an asymmetrical Simple advantage. electronic warfare uh, components and, and yeah. Well, we're, we're more dependent on precision uh, right. targeting than it's they are. So easier to mess things up than to... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, all, that's right. Always simpler to wreck things than to create them. Right. That's mm -hmm. that's true. Um, Somebody ought to write a paper on that. I, yeah, <laughs> I think it, it's been done since Heraclitus. You know, uh, Muhammad Reis wants to know, Adi, why Iran, in spite of the maximum pressure campaign and all these sanctions, secondary sanctions, all the problems, why are they increasing their their um, ac regional activities in the Middle East, what, what the U.S. calls malign activities and, and uh, what um, the Arab countries tend to call uh, destabilizing activities um, in the region. W what is the logic here? And I mean, it's a very, it's a very big question, but you know, a quick answer for Mr. Reif would be great. The, the question is excellent. And, and there are two main explanations for this. One is the internal dynamics within the political system and the military system in, inside of the Islamic Republic. Uh, the uh, bureaucracies of state often have a life of their own and the Iranian military, particularly the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is, is for all practical purposes a state within the state. Uh, they pursue their own agenda and they would like to achieve uh, their own interests. Uh, sometimes even at odds with the interests of the Iranian state. So what they do is because that there is no civilian control over the military institution, uh, the Revolutionary Guard pursues its own agenda uh, and is always demanding more funding from the Iranian state 
And the place that they can use it is, is often outside of Iran. So they engage in operations abroad. And that is a machine which is constantly draining the Iranian state uh, uh, for, for, for money. And the civilian politicians simply do not have the power to uh, stop the flow of funding to the Revolutionary Guard because they also depend on the Revolutionary Guard support in order to suppress the domestic opposition. So that is the price that Iranian civilian politicians have to pay. If they want to be protected against the domestic uh, opposition, they need to fund the Revolutionary Guard, which uses the money abroad. That is the internal explanation. But there is, of course, also an external explanation, which Let's have has to do with leverage. You know, the, if the Islamic Republic, and, and we know that the Islamic Republic will engage in negotiations with the United States, regardless if the, the current administration continues or, or, or does not, uh, the Islamic Republic needs to build some kind of leverage uh, in, the, in, in the time up to, up to the negotiations. And one of the best ways of doing so is by engaging in regional adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, so they start the fire and then they offer the U.S. to engage as mediators or firefighters to solve the problems that they uh, helped create in, in the first place. Great. Anybody want to comment on that or should we move on to the next? Uh, Kristen, you kind of look like you have something on your mind. Is that no, I was just laughing at all this point about them starting a fire and then offering to mediate it because that's- Oh, exactly sure. It's a great analogy and, and it's, it's pretty normal. I've, I've got another sort of uh, question. Uh, well, it's hard, hard to know. All right, I'm going to try to go through three more uh, while we still have time. Um, a quick one here. I mean, does anybody have any thoughts about Russia? Is there any, any reason to think Russia might not sell the S-400 to Iran if Iran wants it? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they just would, but... They, they, held, off, they held off for years on the S-300 after it was paid right. for. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you know, the, the U.S.-Russia relationship is different. I, I know that, uh, in, in my view, the thing that has damaged the Russian regime most in the last five years has been the sanctions on the Nord Stream pipeline. That's really a big uh, thing there. And there are, we are seeing individual sanctions. The Trump administration has really transformed sanctions. When I used to work narcotics in the Clinton administration, you know, our sanctions were you know, preschool level. So they might be willing to swap, um, you know, restraint on the S-400 for relief on sanctions on something else. Of course, it'll have to be couched in more diplomatic But it would terms. take something like that, basically. I, 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 I think that the Russian, the, the, the people who run Russia have a number of interests and the things they are sanctioned for right now are more important to them than, than the money they'd make by selling the S-400. And, and have, particularly- but, but without that kind of leverage, they'll do it. I mean, you would think there's no there's no other reason like on its face, they would probably want to sell this, right? Uh, unless the Nagorno-Karabakh thing turns really, really ugly and somehow becomes a Russia-Iran thing. Uh, this is a nightmare for mm. Iran. So yeah. I, mean, I think yeah. the quicker yeah. they can get the hell out of it, the, the more. Yeah. Never, no, yeah. it's, it's the worst knowing situation the Iranians could face. But anyway, um, any impact on the war in Yemen? Oh, absolutely. From from the lifting of the embargo. Yes, yes. The lifting absolutely. of the embargo. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, this is why we're seeing Saudi debate whether or not they should rush to a political deal or in their preferred scenario, rush to a decisive military victory is because we expect much higher transfers of, of weaponry to the Houthis. Um, you know, th there's that division within the Houthis, one side that says, we're not going to engage in attacks on Saudi again. We want, we want a political deal. We're looking at schools and clinics for our children. And then there's the other side that's far more ideological and believes they are destined to rule the peninsula. You know, and it, there's really, you, you can't really reconcile those two. So right. it makes it tough um, to, to do either a political victory or a military victory that doesn't have victims who would otherwise be your, your partners. Um, and I think we expect Iran to funnel quite a bit more material to the more ideological side that is committed to this mission of taking the peninsula, you know, under their, under their own jurisdiction. Dave, tell me, or Ali, if you think that's incorrect, but we see no indication that there would be a lack of flow there. We, we do know that, you know, we've been successful as an international community in shutting down some of the ways they can get that material yeah. to these guys. Right. But uh, but we expect this to greatly increase in terms of effort. And we think there will be things that they will now be allowed to send that they have, you know, openly. Um, be allowed by whom? Well, some of the, you know, with the embargo lifted, they will have the 
the option of upgrading systems for the Houthis legally that they did not, they do, they had to smuggle under sanctions. Okay. Will yeah. make it much more difficult for us yeah. to counter. Okay, I, I get it. Um, anybody want to uh, speculate about a potential Biden administration? I, I mean, I, Kristen, you talked about, uh, this is from Arif Hassan, uh, you, you talked about the likely continuities. And I think these continuities are hard to speculate about at this stage. Um, but if anyone has any thoughts on that, I, I'd be interested. My fear is that um, Iran is going to take advantage of a Biden administration and the goodwill that the Biden <coughs> would be willing to, to put forth. Because I think, you know, Biden's already made it clear that he'd be willing to offer some sanctions relief to Iran in exchange for their willingness to come to the table and re-enter yeah. the negotiations. It would be both nuclear and perhaps parallel um, on proxy and ballistic missile activity. There's a divide right now within the Biden campaign on how to approach Iran. You know, yeah. do we go whole hog toward JCPOA 2.0? Let's get back into what we thought was good. Or do we only pursue it if we also have a parallel discussion about regional behavior? And they haven't really worked that out quite yet. But but when they do, I think Iran is going to try to take advantage of that. They'll, they'll eke out some, some initial sanctions relief, survive on that for a bit, slow roll the negotiations. For They will not come to any agreement on regional activity, but they will slowly and only in exchange for additional concessions agree to return back to a nuclear deal that approximates with the JCPOA. Right. Place. And I think that will be um, unfortunate because it will be taking advantage of the goodwill that a Biden administration might be willing to show with very little effective change um, on Iran's side in terms of their policy or how they operate in the region. My sense is that the division in the Biden camp among Democrats, in other words, mainstream Democrats, is, is how seriously to take the leverage that the maximum pressure um, sanctions have created, whether to, to di sort of ditch it uh, or milk it. And that's partly political and partly strategic. And we'll see. I mean, we'll know when we see the official, right? And we'll, we'll have a much better sense because there are all kinds of people who could end up in those jobs. And that'll tell us a lot. Um, all right. Uh, we've got quite a few other questions, not a whole lot of time. I'm going to ask a big picture one uh, that's really kind of interesting and we could produce all kinds of responses. Um, this is from Pete Lenson. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, have there been any positive results from the withdrawal from the JCPOA? Big question. And I'd like all of you to, you know, give me your opinion. Yes. So what we've, what we've seen from the withdrawal of the JCPOA is a forced a attention being paid to some of the regional activities, which in the U.S. opinion were under-highlighted uh, prior to that. So, you know, the... Um, we do feel that the withdrawal has forced people to take a look at what Iran is up to. So you saw for the first time at UNGA in, was it 2019, I think you saw the UK, France, and Germany finally admit that they believe that Iran is behind some of, it was the attack on Abkhaz specifically in that instance, but it was the first time that any European country has hold, held Iran accountable for violent activity in the region. And so that has been a positive. And then we also saw for instance, in 2018, we saw a reduction in funding to Hezbollah that very tangibly we saw Hezbollah withdraw from some of their positions in Syria as a result of this. And that told us, OK, there is an impact to the withdrawal and the economic squeeze, for instance. Um, you know, it, it, the withdrawal was intended to arrive at a better deal, to arrive at a deal that also took into account the, the you know, the ballistic missile activities and the proxy activities. So we'll, we'll, if Iran continues to be intransigent on those topics, then you could argue, no, there's been no benefit. But I would say that the opposite is true because it's forcing people to now say, these are a real problem. We've been ignoring them. We've been allowing them. They aren't technically a threat to Europe and they aren't really a threat to the US, but our Gulf partner said, you know, please come help us with this. So, so this, this, microscope on Iran's activities will benefit us because we will be drilling down on how do we reduce them? How do we reduce these weapons transfers? How do we um, defeat some of their proxies and turn them into perhaps political actors instead? How do we bring some of these conflicts to a close? How do we prevent Iran from taking this zero to hero model and, and, and attracting other proxies to also join them in this sponsored violence model? 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I also think it's um, it helped to create problems for Iran in Syria, in Iraq, and in Lebanon, among other places. Although you could argue it created opportunities as well. But I think clearly it, it made their lives more difficult and made their largesse much more hard to dole out, etc. Um, Ali, what do you think? Uh, my answer is not a direct answer to the question, you know, what positive came out of, of, of the, uh, the uh, maximum pressure campaign. Uh, I have always questioned the, the, the philosophy behind and the purpose of, of the maximum pressure campaign, because if there is not a clearly stated purpose with a policy, it's very hard to evaluate it. Well, this uh, is the problem. I never very... found that if the, if the purpose of the maximum pressure campaign was to change the behavior of the Islamic Republic to the better, uh, or it was to change and overthrow uh, the regime. Uh, in my opinion, the Islamic Republic has not improved its behavior in, no. in, in the Middle East region uh, because of the maximum pressure campaign. No. Uh, and it has also not been overthrown. So uh, none of those uh, declared goals of, of the maximum pressure campaign have been achieved. In that sense, I do not believe it has been a success, but maybe I'm misreading the, 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 the entire purpose of the maximum pressure campaign. No, actually, that's, that's how I see it as well. I, I see. I can tell you exactly what the goal leverage. of the pressure campaign was. And it, it was never to create regime change specifically, but it was, to Ali's first point, to, to create a guns and butter decision. The, the rationale was that the regime would has a finite amount of resources and it would have to choose between supporting Quds Force activities outside the country or meeting the needs of its people domestically. And that, of course, like a responsible government, it would choose to meet the needs of its people. That calculation was incorrect. They did choose to continue to support the IRGC and the Quds Force yeah. instead. But, but it did prompt the choice. That. But it did you, prompt you, the choice. So it if, did prompt if the, the choice. Goal was to prompt the choice, it, it worked. But that's not a strategic gain for the United States. That's not, that, well. I mean, it, it not immediately. Not as immediately as they it would be. But it certainly caused things like uh, the the protests in Iran, and it's definitely yeah. caused them to scale back some of their provisions yeah. of yeah. weapons and other support and, to proxies. And it's caused them to to look other places for fundraising. We've seen increased right. activity in Venezuela, for instance. You know, or drug smuggling. Yeah. Right, right. And, and but but one of the things it should be asking the, inter, you know, forcing the inter, international community to ask is, OK, if we now see that they're going to choose this kind of activity over the domestic needs of their country, then shouldn't we alter how we deal with them? Uh, the answer certainly is not to go, OK, well, then we'll let them do that and we'll let them have the nuclear program. You know, that, that's that. You'd hope not. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, you'd hope not. Uh, Dave, uh, what's your yeah. answer to this? And then well, well. I was I was in I was skeptical of the JCPOA's justification at the start because first I'm an inherently skeptical person. Secondly, um, it seemed to me that uh, John Kerry in particular was was in a hurry to get a legacy, uh, having you know basically invested uh, two years in an Israel Palestinian thing didn't go anywhere, and then it seemed to me that we were um, giving up our one leverage, uh, you know, sanctions for just one aspect of the behavior, and so that if we tried to you know, if Hezbollah went in and, you know, wiped out the population of Aleppo, as they did, we didn't have a, a justification for sanctions because the Iranians would say, you're just recharacterizing them. Um, but a bigger issue as to whether there's, uh, and, and the other thing is that the logic uh, behind JCPOA seemed to me to be reminiscent of what we heard about, you know, giving China the Olympic Games or, or the letting China into the GTO that, you know, well, they're liberalized and the benefits will come and then we'll see the government. And, I, I, you know, I, I saw China that doesn't work with authoritarian states. So, um, you know, they'll pocket the benefits and continue to repress. Uh, but I think what, what a lot of people miss here is that, and this, this is not a good Washington think tank argument, but it resonates in the heartland, this idea for what Evelyn Waugh called a moment of moral clarity. You know, at the start of his Sword of Honor trilogy, the hero Guy Crouchback is the, the Stalin-Hitler deal is announced and he says, now I know all the bad guys are on one side, it's time to go. And I think that just the simple idea that we know the Iranians are cheating, we know they're doing things we don't like, we're not going to be involved with it. And we're going to call it out, whether it gives us the finite results we want or not, at least we gain that moment of clarity, uh, of moral clarity. That has value in the heartland. And I think that has value in, in a certain segment of American society. It, it, it's generally discounted or not even thought of here in the, in the bubble we live in. And I think that that 
you know, we, we miss that at our great effect at, at our extent. And I think when you look at Trump administration policy towards Iraq with the threats move the Baghdad embassy and towards uh, Lebanon, I think you also see a desire for that moment of clarity, uh, of moment, moral clarity. And, and nobody else has spoken about it, but I, I do think it exists. And I do think uh, it, it, it explains at least some of the thinking. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not working for me, Dave. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Well, you're, you're not an Evil and Waugh fan, okay? No, I'm not. No, I actually am an Evil and Waugh fan. I'm just not a close the embassy because it's being attacked by a Qatar Hezbollah fan. But it, well, that's uh, you know that doesn't. There's a there's a tactical clarity. argument for that. That doesn't strike me as moral clarity. That strikes me as cut and run. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, thank you all so much for this great discussion. It was wonderful. Ali, Dave, Krishna, thank you. And thanks for tuning in uh, out there all over the world. We got questions from almost everywhere. So thank you so much. Uh, and please join us next time for another AGSIW webinar. Bye-bye, everybody.